In the quietest, darkest vaults of aerospace legends lies a whisper, a mere fleeting shadow of an airplane that, if it ever existed at all, might have been amongst the most incredible aircraft ever created. Presumptively referred to as the SR-91 and given the informal name of Aurora by those who believe it exists, this mysterious creation could just as easily have been a real-life airplane or just a myth. Those who would have commissioned it, the US government, have said nothing. Those who would have built it, Lockheed Martin, claim it never existed at all. And those who claim it did exist or still does, regard it as the most incredible, secretive black project in American history. So today on Mega Projects, we're going to be peering through the mist and trying our best to see the Aurora for what it really was. Perhaps a legend, perhaps a hoax, or perhaps a masterpiece soaring through our skies without a trace. Before we continue, I've got something special to share with you. Something that will add a touch of nature to your style and certainly elevate your fashion game. And that would be today's sponsor, Holzkern. They have over a thousand incredible one-of-a-kind products. Like personally, I love being able to add a touch of nature to my style and Holzkern's jewelry and fashion pieces do just that. The best part, they use entirely natural materials. So you can see here, on this bracelet for this watch that they have the wood. They've also got plenty of watches with a wood back dial. I went for like a skeleton one so you can see the movement in there. It's automatic, so on your wrist it moves around and keeps it charged. Plus, all of the wood that they use is FSC certified, meaning there's no harm to our lovely planet. Their watches are beautiful pieces. They will definitely draw the eye, especially this skeleton one. It just looks cool. People want to look at that. Holzkern have over a million happy customers worldwide. They started as a small family business in Austria, and they've been spreading joy for over eight years. And they've even got 10 physical stores in Germany and Austria. Now, my lovely audience, if you're excited as I am about adding some wood to your style, head on over to Holzkern, H-O-L-Z-K-E-R-N.com slash Simon. And don't forget to use the code Simon and you'll get 15% off. So thank you, Holzkern, for bringing nature to fashion and sponsoring today's video, of course. And now back to it. The United States military is really good at keeping secrets, from the locations of its nuclear submarines, to the capabilities of its fifth-generation fighters, to the identities of its intelligence assets around the world. But there's one group of secrets the Pentagon keeps better than any other. The Black Projects. A series of projects dependent on close working relationships between the United States and its defense contractors, the Pentagon's Black Projects consume tens of billions of dollars every year, disappearing into a hole from which precious little information has ever escaped. In many cases, the results of these projects are never known. In others, they represent some of the most impressive innovations of the United States military. Take the Stealth Attack F-117 Nighthawk, which was mass-produced in secret and announced just months before it flew in a combat mission for the first time, or the Sea Shadow, an experimental stealth ship completed in the mid-1980s. By and large, these are not projects that become known to the public before the Pentagon is good and ready to let the public know, and it's that veil of mystery that has bred one of the most fiercest rumor mills in the world. One such rumor began circulating in 1985, when while poring over the United States annual budget for that year, reporter Ralph Vartbedian of the Los Angeles Times noticed something rather odd. According to an unclassified budget report for the Pentagon, the Defense Department intended to spend a whole lot of money on something called Aurora. What Aurora was, the report didn't specify, but it was clear from the budget projections that two things were true. Aurora was a not insignificant program, and it was in its early stages, with the expectation that it was going to get a lot bigger. The DoD had allocated $80 million for the project in 1986, and in 1987 that number was scheduled to grow exponentially to an investment of $2.3 billion. At face value, both the numbers involved and the general rush towards stealth technology in the US government around this same time led Vardabedian and the general public to believe a few key things. First, this was probably going to be a stealth program of some kind, perhaps working with Northrop or Lockheed to develop a stealth fighter aircraft. Second, the program was moving really fast. $80 million was a pretty small amount of R&D money, whereas $2.3 billion is a whole lot even for the Pentagon. Those numbers spoke to a high-priority program and an ambitious timeline. For reference, the Pentagon was only spending about a billion dollars each year on what would eventually become the B-2 Spirit Bomber. As for who exactly was involved in this Aurora business, it was most likely Lockheed. The company was recruiting intensively at the time and had been seen sending a plane full of Lockheed workers out to an Air Force plant every morning, traveling to an unknown facility. 
According to Varda Median, the windows on that plane were taped over, meaning that not even the project staff knew where they were headed. Of course, we know in the modern day that that could have been for any number of ongoing Lockheed programs at that time, but that wasn't information that the news sources of the day had. Finally, the LA Times and the other reporting news sources knew that it would be highly unusual for the name of such a program to be included in a report. After the existence of an Aurora program, or Aurora something, was publicized, the Department of Defense refused to answer questions about it. According to the DoD, the matter was officially classified. At this point in the Aurora story, we've got to emphasize that this has stayed the official line from the US government ever since, that there was never an Aurora. No such aircraft was ever built, and there has never been an aircraft designed for the purposes that we're about to discuss, specifically a follow-on to the SR-71 Blackbird. But of course, if we put on our skeptics hat, then that's exactly what the government would say, isn't it? Regardless of the DoD's official stance on the matter, the Aurora had emerged into a realm of speculation. And well, speculate we would. So, once the defense analysts and netizens of the world latched onto the idea that an Aurora aircraft might exist, the next question obviously became, well, what is it? One clue as to what it wasn't came from the name. The United States' fighter aircraft, before and after the Aurora was publicized, had typically used the names of not necessarily predatory animals, but animals that can be very aggressive when they need to be. See the F-14 Tomcat, the F-15 Eagle, the F-16 Fighting Falcon, or if you prefer, Viper, the F-A-18 Hornet, the F-22 Raptor. Disregard the F-35 Lightning II, that's a tribute to the P-38 Lightning of World War II. Another significant clue was that the Aurora budget was referenced right after a reference to the TR-1, a batch of U-2 aircraft that were made for tactical reconnaissance missions. Combine those two scraps of information, and it was conceivable to work out that the Aurora wasn't a fighter but perhaps a reconnaissance plane instead. The next question to tackle was just why it would be so expensive, and those who examined the potential project had a few ideas in that department too. Chief among them was that the plane was a successor to the SR-71, filling a role that was expected to be vacant within a few years, but obviously this new plane, with a couple of decades to work, would be better in some way than the SR-71 had been. Those improvements were expected to come in three main areas – speed, altitude, and stealth. In terms of speed, the United States was believed to have the potential to create a hypersonic aircraft, one that could fly at five times the speed of sound or more. Those would use ramjets or scramjets, air-breathing engines that allow for incredibly fast travel, which the United States was believed to either be on the fringes of developing or already had in its arsenal. In hindsight, we know that the Air Force, NASA, and private firms were indeed designing and learning about Mach 5 aircraft during the years immediately preceding 1985, when again, Aurora itself first showed up. Not only that, but work was well underway on the sorts of structures that would allow such an aircraft to survive the intense heat generated by hypersonic travel. Of course, with the capacity to travel at insane speed, would come stealth technology, which seemed more and more to be a cornerstone of just about everything the DoD worked on. And it would also, of course, have the potential to travel at high altitudes as well. As for the shape of the aircraft, both conjecture and the witness reports that we'll discuss in a moment each suggest that the Aurora aircraft would have been wedge-shaped, with small delta wings hugging tight to the main fuselage of the plane. That would allow the aircraft to fly with fewer heating issues. The aircraft was believed to be manned and believed not to be armed, although for a spy plane, logic followed that it would likely have carried onboard cameras, sensors, and other intelligence equipment. It would have been crewed by two people, equipped with a real-time data link for reconnaissance, and would be able to reach most spots around the world quickly and with minimal fuss. At a speed of between Mach 5 and Mach 6, flying dozens of kilometers above the ground, it would have been well outside the range of any current missile technology. Feasibility studies on a hypersonic commercial jetliner suggested that a scaled-down aircraft might have a range of up to 10,000 miles while carrying a one-ton sensor suite. According to aerospace analyst Wolfgang Demisch, the program of this size may have yielded some 30 production line aircraft in total, while security expert Lawrence Harris suggests a probable first flight in or around 1989 and entry into service as early as 1995. Harris's analysis extrapolated a total price tag from $4.4 billion to $8 billion for development and up to another $24 billion to actually produce the fleet. This would put prices potentially as high as a billion dollars per plane. Finally, it most likely got a different name, given that the Aurora name, if indeed it corresponded to this secret program, would probably have been considered compromised in 1985 when it was released to the public. 
The Aurora program never appeared in later Department of Defense materials, at least under that name. And while that in itself shouldn't be much of a surprise, it also meant that any later budget allocations after 1987 were completely hidden to the public. The program could have grown and grown for years, it could have held steady, it could have disappeared, we just don't know. Regardless, the DoD wasn't going to say a word about it, and for a little while, it seemed as if that might be the end of this odd little anomaly. But then the sightings began. One of the earliest sightings of an aircraft that's since been tied to the Aurora legend and perhaps the most credible one to this day came in 1989 when one Chris Gibson, working on the Galveston Key oil rig in the North Sea just eastward of Britain, saw something unusual. Now, if you're the Department of Defense and you're going to be flying an ultra-secret aircraft around, Chris Gibson was not the guy that you wanted to be spotted by. He had spent 12 years with the Royal Observer Corps, a British civil defense organization whose entire job was spotting, identifying, and tracking aircraft. And he was very, very good at knowing what aircraft he was looking at. According to Gibson, he observed an unfamiliar aircraft in the sky in the shape of an isosceles triangle. That is, one with two long sides of equal length and a short third side. Something like an equilateral triangle if you stretch it out by pulling on one of its tips. The unidentified aircraft appeared to be refueling from a Boeing-made KC-135 Stratotanker with a pair of F-111 Aardvark fighter bomber aircraft operating as an escort. For several minutes, the group of aircraft lingered in a part of the sky that Gibson could see before eventually moving out of sight. Gibson sketched the incident, although he wouldn't publicize it until 1992 when he presented the account to Jane's Defense Weekly. By that time, sightings of a strange, unidentified aircraft over the British Isles had grown far more common. Most of the reported incidents took place over Scotland and England, with press rumors suggesting that whatever they were seeing was operating out of RAF Machrahanish on Scotland's peninsula of Kintyre. Locals reported not only seeing an aircraft that matched the Aurora's visual description, but produced loud sonic booms and other noises. The British government appeared to investigate the report, always as if they too were being kept in the dark about whatever was going on. As British Defence Secretary Tom King said in 1992, there is no knowledge in the MOD of such a black hole program of this nature, although it would not surprise the relevant desk officers in the air staff and defence intelligence staff if it did exist. And nor was Chris Gibson the only person who believed he'd seen the aurora in the sky. One Royal Air Force officer, Group Captain Tom Eels, reported that in the autumn of 1993, a strange plane had passed over his home near the U.S. Air Force's Middenhall base in Suffolk. According to Eels, there was, quote, a very strange-sounding aircraft passing overhead. The engine noise was a pulsing sound, quite unlike anything I'd ever heard before. Eels didn't get much of a look at the plane, but saw lights disappearing in the direction of the Mindenhall base. When he asked a senior RAF officer about the aircraft the following day, he received very forceful instructions to stop asking about the thing. And while this alleged secret aircraft would have been in Britain, there are at least some indicators that something might have gone wrong. A few weeks prior to Eels' sighting, an unknown US aircraft had been forced to land at the base, but was quickly hidden from sight and taken away from the airbase in a C-5 Galaxy aircraft. A year later, a mysterious crash in the Boscombe Down RAF base, a known testing site for military aircraft, saw a massive response by US military aircraft and British Special Air Service personnel, with the base itself being closed shortly afterward. Since that time, reports have emerged that the crash was due to a towed missile decoy malfunctioning, but even if we accept that premise, it certainly fueled Aurora speculation at the time. Several news sources, including The Independent, reported that a top-secret hypersonic American spy plane had crashed based on a report by Air Forces Monthly. The Independent also referenced unexplained sonic booms over the Netherlands in 1992 and intercepted radio transmissions from an airplane descending from 65,000 feet, altitudes that, at that time, were not thought to be reached by any aircraft other than the U-2 plane or the space shuttle. Then there's the sightings that came out of the United States, starting with a series of unusual sonic booms across Southern California with a profile that suggested a small vehicle with no known match. Later analysis has indicated that it was traveling at a speed of between Mach 4 and Mach 5.2 at an altitude of around 90,000 feet. In 1990, Aviation Week and Space Technology published claims that there was a high-altitude aircraft crossing over the night sky at extremely high speeds over the continental United States, sometimes seen as a single pulsating bright light. In 1992, an observer in Texas spotted unique contrails, referred to as donuts on a rope, which he associated with a deep pulsating roaring sound that caused his home to vibrate. Not only that, but that same observer, Stephen Douglas, claims that he had intercepted radio transmissions in which two aircraft were heard using the call signs 
Dark Star November and Dark Star Mike. Call signs that did not make sense given how aircraft known to use the Dark Star moniker would not have produced those specific aerial phenomena. In a separate 1992 incident, observers around Beale Air Force Base, the longtime home of the SR-71, reported a triangular aircraft that seemed to resemble the Aurora. An Area 51 enthusiast named Chuck Clark even claims to have filmed the Aurora taking off from Groom Lake, although he claimed to have kept his tape of the incident locked away. Given the array of witness statements and testimonies, analysts who followed the Aurora legend for years believed that the aircraft would have been undergoing testing in the southwestern United States and possibly in Scotland as well, but could very well have assumed an operational role, explaining the instances in which it allegedly popped up around the world. By mid-1992, analyst Bill Sweetman was confident enough to suggest that whatever program was responsible for a wave of sonic booms believed to be attributed to Aurora wasn't just working with a prototype. Instead, it was going on missions around the world, doing who knows what, and when it operated in closely allied countries, the people at the heads of those national governments didn't appear to know what was going on. But all this speculation was blunted in a major way in 1994 when a book by Ben Rich, the former heads of the Lockheed Skunk Works division that's been responsible for the SR-71 and many of the United States' other coolest black projects, attempted to put the Aurora issue to bed once and for all. As Rich said himself, Although I expect few in the media to believe me, there is no code name for the hypersonic plane because it simply does not exist. According to him, Aurora had been a budgetary code name to refer to the project that would eventually evolve into the B-2 Spirit Bomber, and the name had bumbled its way into the budgetary report as a simple mistake. Of course, how much credence you give this idea is really up to you. On the one hand, Ben Rich is perhaps the most knowledgeable person outside the Pentagon on what Aurora might have been, and he was out of Lockheed Martin by the time he published his book. On the other, he was also a deeply enmeshed civilian inside the DoD's mess of secrets, and the question of whether his assertion is believable has been the subject of debate in itself. So, with a nebulous entity that might or might not be known as the Aurora program, represented here as fully as we here at Mega Projects are able, we're left with one really critical question. Did the Aurora ever exist? In our answer, we're going to refer to Alex Hollings, writing for the National Interest in October of 2023. Said Hollings, After poring over historical media reporting, declassified documents, eyewitness accounts, and more forum posts than you could photograph from the U-2, it seems extremely unlikely that the United States ever had an operational fleet of secret hypersonic aircraft. But that doesn't mean something like it never darkened the massive hangar doors at Area 51. Now, we're going to take Mr. Hollings at his word when it comes to all of those forum posts, but we concur that even if an Aurora or an Aurora-like program has flown, even if or whatever flyable end product it produced did at some point fly over Britain and other US allies in Europe, that a production line fleet in the multiple dozens of planes was probably never built. At an incredible cost per plane, it would have been very difficult for the US government to hide such a large-scale procurement. And while the incident rate of sightings is by no means low, it's not nearly on the level that would suggest a large large number of aircraft in continual operation. Not only that, but it is hard to keep a secret this big for this long. Between program staff, current and former employees at Skunk Works, pilots, maintenance crews, foreign military members who saw the thing at foreign air bases and more, it's more likely than not that all these people would have let something slip. But that likelihood goes way down if we're talking about the circles that would be in the know if a prototype or a small handful of four to six aircraft were ultimately produced. That being said, the witness reports we've covered here from seemingly credible sources, for the most part, they share enough commonalities that it's not unreasonable to assess that there was something in the sky, spreading strange sonic booms and funky pulsating sounds in the early to mid-1990s. Some of the most compelling evidence of the Aurora, the profiles of the sonic booms it produced, suggest that a plane matching the Aurora's description and capabilities might well have been flying around out there. Not only that, but there would have been real strategic value in having a replacement for the SR-71. But with a plane that can travel so far and so fast, even a couple of working prototypes or a very small air fleet could have made a big impact, while keeping the overall fleet number small would have simultaneously kept costs low, kept the program in the shadows, and reduced the likelihood of a plane crashing, malfunctioning, being spotted, or otherwise becoming known to either the general public or America's adversaries. Also of note is the Department of Defense's rationale for ending the SR-71 program, which of course has been regarded as the reason the Aurora would need to exist at all. 
According to the DoD, the SR-71's operating and maintenance costs were simply too high to justify its continued operation. But a second, equally important piece was to consider that satellites could perform global surveillance more efficiently and for much cheaper than manned aircraft like the Blackbird. But that claim has come under fire too, with a wide range of analysts before and after the program's cancellation all emphasizing that the intelligence value of a high-speed, high-stealth reconnaissance aircraft goes beyond what satellites can offer. They're lower flying. They can get to a spot over a target just as fast or even faster. They can move with a lower probability of being tracked, and they're easier to dispatch on a moment's notice to deal with emerging crises. Most days, satellites will be enough. But when geopolitical tensions really start getting serious, you're going to want to have an Aurora in your back pocket. And lastly, we turn back to Skunk Works for an indicator that hypersonic plane technology has evolved even further than it hypothetically would have in the days when the Aurora was said to have flown. That indicator comes in the form of the SR-72, a hypersonic unmanned aircraft proposed privately by Lockheed Martin to the US government in 2013. According to Lockheed Martin itself, in 2018, a prototype SR-72 was then expected to fly by 2025. And recently, Lockheed Martin has been more and more willing to drop hints that a hypersonic something does indeed exist and was possibly already delivered to the US Air Force. We bring up the SR-72 not because we believe that it's the Aurora. Uh, we would, in fact, argue that that's not the case at all. Instead, we bring it up because if indeed it is real, then it would be a massive evolution on any of the technologies included in the Blackbird or any other known aircraft belonging to the United States government. The development of advanced military technology like this is not something that happens in leaps and bounds or all at once. Instead, progress is typically incremental, with each new development building toward the next, and the next, and the next after that. For the United States to go from the SR-71 to the SR-72 with nothing in between would be highly unusual. Here at Mega Projects, our best guess is that the USA didn't go from the 71 to the 72 at all. Looking at all the information we know, and all the information we think we know, we'd be willing to bet that there was an aircraft in the middle, possibly a whole series of them. We don't know what they did, we don't know how many there were, we don't know how long they were operated, but there is a hole in the United States' chronology of high-speed intelligence aircraft, and if that hole was ever filled, then it was by a plane we call Aurora, even if its true name might stay forever lost to history. Now, just before you go today, don't forget to check out our fantastic sponsor today, Holzkern. There is a link in the description below. Don't forget to use the code SIMON as well, and you'll get 15% off, and I'll see you next time.